Hi, my name is Chris Konetsky. I'm the editor of The Business Record. Uh, today what we've done is we've gathered a, a group of HR professionals and executives to talk a little bit about some of the challenges and opportunities uh, within that field. Um, the format that we're going for today is a little bit like our Power Breakfast, if you're familiar with those. Uh, so we'll have a panel discussion, we'll be asking questions. Um, but one of the things that we, we've tried this once before, a couple times before actually, and one of the things that we found is before our Power Breakfast, we actually gather our panelists together uh, for a sort of pre-event meeting to talk about uh, the topic and drum up questions and issues. And we've always felt that that's been something that we wanted to try to capture. Um, so what we're hoping to go for today is we're going to be having a discussion and talking about topics uh, relating to HR. And uh, the goal is to allow you to be a fly on the wall for that conversation. You'll see myself and our reporter Joe Gardias who will be taking notes, gathering story ideas for future articles. Um, and we're, our hope is to give you kind of a little bit of a glimpse into that conversation, into some of the key issues and things that are impacting us. So we won't be addressing the camera from this point forward, uh, but feel free to join along. And, uh, and uh, also make sure to follow up. Joe will be writing a story that will be highlighting some of the key issues from this video. So with us today, we have, we have Kevin Picorni. He's the principal at Picorni Consulting. We have Beth Raymond. She's the Senior Vice President and Chief Human Resources Officer for Principal Financial Group. We have Kevin Ellsbury, the Vice President of Human Resources for Mercy Medical Center, and Chrissy Smith, the Vice President of HR Operations for Merit Resources. Uh, I'm going to turn it over now to our reporter, Senior Staff Writer Joe Gardias. Uh, he's our HR and Education Beat reporter. Uh, he's been with us for 12 years now. He's actually the longest tenured reporter on staff, so wow. yeah, it's quite, quite the privilege to have Joe with us today. Uh, Joe's actually new to this beat, though, um, but it actually melds really well uh, with uh, some of his previous beats that he also is still covering. He covers insurance and uh, finance, so healthcare issues as well fall into that, into that field, um, as well as uh, education. So those are all, all things that kind of are, are mixing well in there and weave in there nicely. Uh, so this will be a great opportunity for Joe to get some more specific insight directly into HR. So please be kind to me. <laughs> <laughs> so um, well, thank you all for being here and uh, really appreciate your making the time to, uh, to join us. Uh, we wanted to start off with, um, uh, with just a very broad general question and that's, uh, uh, you know, there, there are all kinds of things that we see happening, um, you know, either peripherally or directly in our companies and our organizations with, uh, with changes and, and how the workforce uh, is operating. And uh, we wanted to open it up with, um, with just uh, some observations about what are, what are some of the most interesting or emerging trends that you're seeing right now in Greater Des Moines with, with your organizations. And um, I could I could pick on someone or uh, why don't we start all the way down the <laughs> okay, <I'm not laughs> <on> the <outside laughs> well, by the way, thank you for inviting me. It's great to be with everybody else here too. It's wonderful. Thanks, Joe. Uh, two things come to me and it's, it's basically because that's what I do in my business, uh, but that's what I see happening with the clients that I serve here in Central Iowa, and that's coaching um, and team development. Um, that's not going away, the whole issue about how organizations function in teams um, and the aspect of making sure that they function effectively and the ongoing evaluation and assessment of that. And then the coaching, yeah, that can be anywhere from uh, upper level executives, human executives and so on, to for example, I'm coaching an executive director of a nonprofit. Uh, that's been going on for nine months. Just providing a sense of space for that person coaching him in the context of how he moves the organization and with his staff and so on. Just those needs of saying, I need some breathing space to go some, to someone else and offer some, hopefully, a, a time period for guidance and development and to listen to me. Great things. That's what I, several things I see. I'm going to just yeah. reinforce that around coaching, yeah. you know, uh, around, we're really getting a more discipline around coaching. I think in the past, coaching might have been more around you know, this person has an issue. I'm gonna bring a coach in to kind of focus on this issue. We, we're really looking far more broadly on that to say, who do we want to invest in? Mm -hmm. And kind of help them from an overall development, help them with a career progression, help them somewhat address some of the things, mm -hmm. you know, that maybe could get in their way, but also help them think about the organization broadly. So 
um, while it wasn't one of the things I was going to talk about, I'm here to kind of reinforce your position, right? To say, <laughs> I think that's an evolving discipline and getting more and more important all the time. Yeah, and I, I would agree with that. And if you think in terms of within an organization and succession planning, yeah. and those individuals who you're hoping to get into the C-suite or into those executive level positions, investing in that coaching, mm -hmm. also investing in the executive, maybe leadership training, mm -hmm. um, where you're truly spending more time with those individuals, because you hope those individuals will take some of those senior leadership roles in the future. Yeah, yeah the stigma around coaching, at least in our discipline, we are definitely trying to move past, right? And again, you, you're, this is your discipline, so you know yeah. it far better than we do, but I think sometimes there's a belief that because there's an issue, right? I mean, and now it's, you know, is that not that at all? Yeah. We're really seeing that too in the small to mid-sized business markets that we work with at Merit Resources, that um, there is a just growing need for companies to ensure that they have very strategic workforce plans, that they have succession plans in place, that they have top talent, right people, right positions right now at all times, and they're really building those bench strengths. And we have also found coaching and mentoring, leadership development, mm -hmm. all of the talent development suites to be um, not just even hot, not just important, but hot ticket items for our yeah. clients, really needs and wants for our clients. So. Yeah. Okay. yeah, one of the kind of trends, and I, I won't say it's a new trend, right, but I, I do believe it's an evolving trend and becoming, and going to become even more important to the role we play is around this, what we used to call work-life balance. Mm -hmm. That's kind of evolved into some terminology on work-life fit. Mm -hmm. and, and when you really look at the, the millennials, I think that's where the work-life fit is even changing more to say, you know, how does work fit into a lifestyle now, right? Which is a very different thought process, and that gets to, okay, how, how do they work and play almost simultaneously, right? And that gets into, you know, how do you how do you have a digital workplace in which there's more collaboration for folks? How do you get into yeah. teaming? Yeah. How do you, so there's a trend here that I think is only gonna pick up speed and it's gonna be important for us to think about the environment we're creating for our employees and how, how they strike, whatever that means to that millennial generation along with meeting, certainly meeting the needs of the business as well. Yeah, I like, I like that difference of the work-life fit from work-life balance, but could you, could you describe the, where you see the difference between balancing and fitting? I, I think that's... Yeah, I, mean, I think the balancing, the connotation is that at some point it's all going to feel like it's in sync, uh -huh. right? And I think then it creates this expectation when you don't feel like your life is in sync that you're not doing something, you know, to get it there. Mm -hmm. Work-life fit to me is at some point you're always going to have a little more in one spot, a little more in the other spot. Mm -hmm. And so it gives you, I would say, more flexibility to think about your life without kind of judgments or condemnation personally on yourself, right around, I'm doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. And so, again, I think the terminology first was balance because you were trying to get it, but at some point, I think we're all acknowledging, I think the days of thinking about balance are, are gone or different than the way we need to think about that going forward. And I, I had recently attended a conference and one of the speakers that had, had, was talking about work-life balance. And what she had indicated is it's no longer work-life balance, it's just finding me time. Um, because when you think in terms of technology, you know, you go on vacation, yeah. you're not totally disconnected from work. You're still checking your emails, you're still answering yeah. your phone calls, but you're spending that time with your family. So maybe you designate, I'm only gonna spend from eight o'clock until 10 o'clock doing work, and then the rest of the time is me time with my family. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's how you further define that, that I don't wanna say work-life balance, because that's, that right. truly is in the past. Right. There was an interesting article in Time Magazine as a cover article a couple of weeks ago about uh, what happened to vacations, and, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and uh, mm -hmm. maybe, uh, maybe you, you, we could talk a little bit about uh, are people taking their PTO, uh, their paid time off, their vacation time, uh, are they using it, uh, and are your company, or, and are your organizations really stressing uh, that need for people to get their vacation time in? Yeah, I would I would say in principle people are taking their vacation time, but it looks different today than what it did, right? So I think to your point, I, I think, you know, 5, 10, 15 years ago, people went on vacation and, you know, you worked very hard to clear your desk and get your meetings and everything <laughs> taken care of so you could go on vacation, kind of disconnect from the work environment enjoy whatever you were doing and then come back to your desk and your, you know, that was overflowing and trying to get connected again. With technology, with being able to leverage collaboration, I think people can work anywhere now. And there are a number of people that feel like getting to this fit, if I completely disengage, I am not, 
I, I don't have a life then when I come back that fits the it's need not that I have. No. And so I have the opportunity now, right, to do some of these things in a combined way mm -hmm. that I think, I'll say our generation, I think, is, is, is doing that. And certainly that millennial, they, they flip second to second or minute to minute, right? I mean, they're, I'm working and all of a sudden I'm engaging in something. And so that trend, I think, is only going to pick up speed. And I think another thing that you're going to find, um, especially at the executive level, is PTO, as it's defined, yeah. may be a thing of the past. Mm -hmm. It's just going to be time off. Mm -hmm. um, you know, an executive or exempt level employees, you get paid regardless. Mm -hmm. um, when an executive's on vacation, you are checking your emails, you are, you are doing work business, so it may be that I'm just away from the office. There is no, quote, you're going to accrue mm -hmm. four weeks of PTO. You're just going to take time off when you need to take time off because you're getting paid regardless. And you are doing that work while you're away from the office. And your objectives that you have to accomplish don't leave just because you took a week of vacation. So no. that really helps you define yeah. that you know, I was, balance bit. <laughs> I was on vacation earlier this, this February and I, I was golfing. And I said, you know, I'm gonna just turn my phone all the way off for like a five hour stretch. And it was, you know, we, we were light on staff back at the office mm -hmm. and I was a little uncomfortable about it. Yep. But it was actually, un I almost felt uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, and it was, it was just really uh, unsettling. But when I turned, like, it was really nice. So I, I look back on that and I can think about, I focused on what I was currently right. doing at that point, which was with friends and, and yeah. golf, and, and that was a, a big relax, yeah. relaxation. But, but it didn't have to be a whole day, right? right? right. I mean, so that's, right. again, it's... Yeah. And, and we talk in terms of executive level, but even if you think in terms of a generation coming up, you know, when, when cell phones first came out, we were so strict that you cannot use a cell phone while you're at work. Well, it's tied to them. I mean, mm -hmm. that, that is part of their life, and you have to become more relaxed with those policies. So I think these generations coming up, we're going to have to be looking in terms of how do we balance their work along with their personal lives so they can stay connected, so, so they can um, feel comfortable while they're at work because that cell phone and that connectivity to all the outside and stuff that's going on is extremely important to them. That, uh, that kind of ties in with another area that I uh, wanted to uh, consider and that's uh, what sort of technology um, uh, do you think uh, you, that people are using either personally uh, or, um, uh, or related to what, what uh, <coughs> organizations are providing or really helping to improve productivity or, or maybe what are some areas that are, uh, that are hurting it uh, right now or that need to be, that are uh, HR departments are addressing? If I could, uh, some of my clients are retail, <clears throat> so your mm -hmm. storefront and so on. Um, and, and we've all seen this as customers and so on. The, the availability to get a purchase right there using, for example, Square Reader, which I, which, which I use. All right, and so the access of that is so easy to use, and so the transaction of it can occur instantly. It doesn't cost much. It's easy. It really uh, creates that that purchasing with the client just very seamless. I mean, I love using it, and um, and I'm 62, and I can figure it out. Okay, <laughs> you know, and that's that's the advantage of yes, it. It's right. becoming far more easy. Intuitive. You see, you see people, you know, using it. On the flip side, if I can kind of make a comment back here, I was meeting with a couple folks from the Young Professional Connection, and I'm president of the Des Moines Westside Chamber, and we're talking about doing some, some mentoring and so on. And one of the issues that they're faced with is this, and that is how do I get rid of this? How do I shut it down? Mm -hmm. Because it creates transitness. All right, so I think there's a dual, there's a dual side to the technology. It's great to have, but it also creates a sense of how do I let this go and just focus? That's uh, one thing. So <laughs> it's really funny. Be present, that. and so you know, technology works both ways. Yes, for it. So it's very interesting to hear that from their perspective. I don't have a term for it yet, but I, I liken it to like a, like all of a sudden it's like a bomb goes off. Like you're, you're working on something, you get distracted, and then a Facebook message pops up. Yeah. Your phone buzzes, a calendar <laughs> invite pops up on your computer, a phone call happens, and it all happens at once, and all these things, all of a sudden it just happens. And I, I, if it's I've happened a few times. I've witnessed Yeah, and all of, a sudden I just, all of a sudden I just pull away and go, okay. <laughs> Too much stimulation. I, like, there was almost like an overstimulation yeah. moment, and I, I don't have a word for that, and maybe there's some research out on that, but it's something that I've definitely noticed a few times, and it just kills your productivity when, when that's happening. So. Yeah, there are times where 
we, we have our executive retreats and why they call them a retreat. I don't know because it's an all-day meeting. What <laughs> but you have all of us executives around the table and, and we all have our laptops up. And we're yeah. having conversations, but we're checking our, our, our emails and doing business while we are around the table. Um, I've also been at um, meetings at the national office where they say, okay, for the next three hours, everybody put your cell phone away. We need total concentration on yeah. this project. And you truly put your cell phone away and you get so much more accomplished during that three hours than you probably got during an entire day when you had a, a laptop sitting in front of you. So I think if you can, you can indicate, okay, we're gonna do a, a three hour meeting. Here you go, everybody, here it is up front. You gotta put your cell phones away. Then we'll allow you to check them during the break. Everybody's comfortable with it, you know. We have that rule with our senior team meetings at Merritt. No cell phones are allowed. You can use your iPad or your Surface, but it has to be on airplane mode so that you're not distracted by emails. And it is truly amazing how much more work yeah. we accomplish yeah. when people are not distracted. Yeah. Yeah. It does make sense. You know, it's hard. It's, yeah. we, every one of us, when he first told us that we were moving to that, was like, no way. How is that going to be able to meet us? Yeah. He's like, they're going to still need you after three hours. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. okay. Is that just a, an evolution of, you know, now that we've been you know, if you think about how the cell phone is really, what, 15 years? I mean, there, there were obviously yeah. before, but the yeah. smartphone is only 10, yeah, just about a decade, I guess. It's just people starting to evolve to realize that things swung way too far, maybe one way, and are, are now trying to figure out, okay, well, it allowed me to get so much more done, now it's actually overloading mm -hmm. the other way. And I think then um, some new technology will replace it, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you're talking about the cell phones, but we, you know, we all were part of the days of BlackBerry too, right? Yeah. And so, you know, yeah. and they derogatorily told it, called it CrackBerry, right? And <laughs> again, you were looking for it to buzz, you were working on it, right? And so, and then the phone came along. And, and now the smartwatch. Know, and, right, exactly. So yeah. I think yeah. there's, yeah. there's a new watch. technology, <laughs> I think, that'll come that will work for a period of time and then People need to take that step back and say, okay, what do I leverage now so that I don't go to that place? Mm -hmm. yeah. One area where I do think that technology is having a very positive impact in our um, industry, however, is um, in providing with us with real data yeah. to make yeah. real um, targeted, defined, strategic plans related to people strategies, um, related to how we're building our workforces, how we're making sure we have right people in right positions all the time. Um, and in our world, it's really about helping our clients do that and helping them really build out their employment life cycle. But the technology platform that we have is something that makes it so much easier for businesses to manage the, their businesses with their people data. Yeah. Do you have some examples of some of the ways maybe you guys have used, used data with, uh, to help some of the small and medium sized businesses? We do dashboard reporting mm -hmm. for all of our clients. So every month they have a report that shows them all of their in and out activities, so the recruitment and retention activity. Um, also to be able to provide them with information related to engagement scores or pre-assessments for talent acquisitions, the ability to use technology to provide a database of resumes and applicants for pools for um, top count candidates for whatever position they're looking at. But then we also offer a whole host of reporting that is related to their payroll data and what they're spending on benefits and um, total compensation packages, um, looking at really what they're truly offering to their employees. Yeah. We can even provide them with reporting so they can monitor who is using their PTO and taking their PTO or um, how they're setting up their PTO plans or what the liability is in PTO. So, I mean, there's just a whole host of areas where we're able to really take that data and then build systems, customize systems and processes. Mostly um, for our clients, that's what we do, is we work with our clients and say, what are your strategies for the next three, five, 10 years? And then we take a look at what systems do you need to ha have in place in order to be ready for that? And we can really use the data to help them sure. see yeah. what we're doing and if it's effective, if it's working, or if there are other areas where they would be better equipped to spend their time. I would imagine uh, two large companies like Mercy and the principal, you guys have access to some different data as well. I'm curious if there's some other ways that you guys have used uh, big data sets. You know, we, we use it every day um, when you look in terms of whether it be pulling turnover reports, um, again, um, we're part of a larger organization, which is Catholic Health Initiatives out of Denver. Um, huge amounts of data that come in. Um, we get reports on, I would say we're getting a report almost on a, a daily basis regarding 
just with, like you had indicated, um, mm -hmm. be it benefit costs, be it um, uh, in terms of payroll issues, all of those things come across almost instantaneously. Um, the one other area that I would say that has, has benefited in terms of an organization is the employee self-portal. Um, where mm -hmm. employees can go in yeah. and yeah. it saves so much time and energy from the HR standpoint because they can go in and they can do their address changes, they can add employees to their, or uh, dependents to their, their benefit plans, they can change their 401k distribution. All that stuff is done without the assistance of somebody else doing it or else they can go in there in real time and they can get that information and it's right there at their fingertips rather than having to depend on somebody else to gather that information for them. Uh, uh, one aspect, um, um, uh, 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 changing course a little bit, uh, is just uh, to ask about um, one of the one of the concerns you know that I write about and that I hear about so often with with that every size company is uh, is the um, um, health care health care reform, and um, I wanted to um, to see what uh, what some of um, uh, large company small company concerns are. At this juncture, uh, where um, you know where things stand, you know, are our, our companies even getting uh, getting a uh, getting a chance to take a breath at this point? Uh, and what what's the next big concern with um, with with uh, the whole healthcare uh, arena? Well, our smallest companies are trying to figure out how to stay competitive in the benefit arena, um, as it in terms of recruiting and retaining top talent. Um, for the mid-sized companies, you know, they're gearing up for 2016 compliance, and then our large companies, the companies large to us is over 100 for excited employees. <laughs> so our, our large companies that so we really, fit that yeah. category. <laughs> right, right, right. So 116 million, it doesn't matter. <laughs> but our large companies, we're really working aggressively with them today on compliance issues with the ACA, and I would say that for our mid-sized too, because we have to be ready for their compliance indicators. The biggest challenge that we have really found, particularly with our small employers, is the way they track the data to ensure that they're really um, monitoring who is eligible for participation. From the merit perspective, we do all the work behind the scenes to ensure the affordability provisions are met and the other provisions of the ACA compliance pieces mm -hmm. are met. But individually, some of our businesses, because they're so small, they still use paper time cards, you know, mm -hmm. or wow. they use a system that doesn't track hours the way we need it to. So we're working with them to set up those systems. And that's, again, where the technology really comes into play for us. And that's a neat thing that we have really seen, though. And this is, I mean, I, I just read an article the other day that technology is becoming a billion dollar, in, it, HR technology is becoming yeah. a billion dollar yeah. industry. And I think a big part of it is having partners that keep up with those types of things. So having good partners that are really creating time and attendance modules that are really providing that compliance piece. Mm -hmm. Um, for the tracking, because it's not even as much about that as it is about the end of the year reporting that we have to do and being able to pull those numbers. Can I ask you, Christy, do you see that maybe some of your clients are shifting more of the costs of the insurance to their uh, to their employees we have, through premiums and so on, or what, what's your sense right. of that as well as I'd like to hear that from yes. Mercy and Principal. You know, we're really sticking pretty tight to the belt to the affordability piece, the affordability okay. requirement, and okay. then um, having that latitude to create creative contribution strategies is yeah. really been um, imperative for the success of some of our businesses. Mm -hmm. That this is it's a cost for them, oh, but yeah. it's a necessary part of competition in our markets, um, competing for top talent. Um, so I think, yeah, I think we're definitely yeah. seeing that. Seeing what we are also seeing is um, a recognition of a couple different things related to the different generations in our workforces. Um, one is that employees want choice, and mm -hmm. the choice is very different depending on where you are. So what we're trying to offer is many different types of benefit plans for employees so they can have choice, they can make their choice. Mm -hmm. But then what we're trying to do on the offset of that strategy is really ensure that the risk is in how you manage your own health care, mm -hmm. as opposed to in the cost up front. So a plan that has a low, de um, low deductible and a very good copay, for example, obviously is going to cost more than if sure. an employee is really at a position okay. where they can invest yeah. in a high deductible health plan. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah and in addition to that, if, if you look in terms of I mean, I agree with you. Uh, employees are going to have to be sharing more of the cost. Um, they're going to have to be more involved in terms of their own health. Yeah. Um, you within an uh, within an insurance um, 
program that you have for your employee, employees, you're going to have to be able to have incentives in there for them to stay healthy. Yes. Um, because a, a healthier your population as far as employees are, go, the, the less usage you're going to have sure. within your health insurance, the lower the cost can be. And, and as, if you work together and you stay healthy, then you're going to have lower costs. The premium um, are not going to go up as much um, as, you, as, as they maybe had done in the past. You know, things that we do within our organization, I mean, even if you uh, give them um, discounts to a wellness center or, or you have a wellness center or you um, do biometric screenings and you do other incentives for them and, and if they do biometric screenings, have their, have their annual uh, physical, these types of things, they get an additional $250 off of their health insurance premium. You know, something like that. So it truly does incentivize them to, to become healthy and it does um, help your insurance costs go down. And isn't that an interesting yeah. thing? I think that's been interesting to watch because there was a whole kick on wellness like five to ten years ago. And then it was kind of like, well, wellness doesn't work. Well, now we're seeing wellness is imperative, yeah. right? So yeah. those activities are really must be connected. And then if you have your health insurance plans that also include coaches mm -hmm. um, for those individuals that do have a, a um, health illness that, that's going to... Um, be costly to the organization. You've got these coaches that are helping them to get on track. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So again, there's all kinds of avenues that you can use with an insurance plan to try to uh, steer your employees to more of a healthier lifestyle. To your point, we've had the, well, to both your points, we've had the health screening and the biometrics at principal for our employees for, I, I think, almost close to 10 years now. Mm -hmm. And um, we have over a $500 incentive. You know, mm -hmm. you will pay more, yeah. $500 more yeah. for a you know, per person, if you don't do the screenings and you don't do, you know, the wellness assessment because it, it we have actually, people have actually caught diabetes, prostate cancer, yes. I mean, there are yeah. things that get caught in that screening that you might assume wow. got done through other wellness right. things, yeah. but, you know, yeah. to your point, the key is catching it early mm -hmm. yeah. um, and then having the right programs in place, and so we believe very strongly with that, and then and the design compete, you know, components, whether it's centers of excellence, whether it's programs, you know, we have a lot of claims on pregnancies, as you would imagine, you know, 60% of our population is women, and so how do you have programs like a pregnancy program that right. is educational, that says these are the things you should do in the stages of your pregnancy to keep you and your child right. um, healthy through this mm -hmm. process, and I think sometimes we make assumptions that people will naturally do that, but there are some incentives for people to go through that process as well. And so so uh, I, I wonder uh, how much um, how much people are taking advantage of the programs and are are the um, in, in your larger organizations mm -hmm. are you seeing um, are you really seeing an uptake in uh, in response to these programs? Uh, so for that we have around 90% of our employees wow. that do the the screening piece mm -hmm. so that they're not paying that $500 additional. Um, and then we leverage that information. So kind of going back to your you know, how to use information. Um, you know, we try to, we don't see people individually, right? So we want to make sure that everybody understands that with HIPAA regulations, we, we do not see individual employee information, but we get a lot of collected information to show here's our top risk factors, so we know how to educate, what kind of programs we should put in place from a plan design perspective. So it's good for the employee to get that information, but it's really good for the employer yeah. to get that information yes. because you can leverage that to figure out design and ways to really support your employees so that um, overall they're not paying more for premiums over the long term. And they are taking care of their health, yeah. Yeah. which is so good. Yeah. yeah, and we've had a large percentage of our employees that have also participated in the biometric screenings. You know, as far as our health insurance premiums, um, we, you know, we've had the, the ACO, the Clinically Integrated Network, um, we've had that in place for a couple of years. And our insurance premiums really have not gone up significantly for our employees. And we attribute that, again, mm -hmm. to the fact that, you know, we have had um, the Y memberships, we have had the discounts as far as um, insurance premiums for those that don't smoke. I mean, we, we have so many um, incentives for the yeah. employees, and we yeah. have been able to keep our health insurance costs down overall for our employees. So it does have a direct impact. Yeah. Wow. yeah, I mean, I think the external trend for medical is, you know, increases 10 to 12 percent mm -hmm. um, per year. The pharmacy is higher than that, maybe you know, 12 right. to 15. So altogether, you know, you're talking about 12 plus percent. I could say for principal, we've typically been on that 5 percent trend, or somewhere between mm -hmm. 5 to 7. So you know, some of that is plan design, but a lot of that is that proactiveness to make sure you've got healthy employees. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that uh, some people have talked about is businesses moving away from offering health insurance. Is that something that moving forward in the future that as some of the uh, exchanges uh, 
become a little robust that possibly you see businesses saying, well, maybe this isn't a benefit that we're going to offer. We're going to find other ways to incentivize. You know, I, I've heard organizations where rather than spending a given pot of money and providing the health insurance, they may say, okay, here you go. I'm going to give you four thousand dollars or right. whatever yeah. and you can go purchase your yeah. own plan mm -hmm. um, you know from, from my organization standpoint I don't think we're there um, and I don't know that that's anything in the short or long term but I knew that it I know that is an option for some mm -hmm. employers that are out there yeah. yeah I think all the conversations we had it's not that we would get out of mm -hmm. we might get out of providing it to our mm -hmm. employees right but I think to be competitive in this marketplace you have to have medical insurance that's available um, my personal opinion right now is the exchanges are not such that we would feel comfortable with that being an offering today for our employees. Mm -hmm. I think time is needed to get those up and running and meet the needs, but if those would evolve, I think it would be something we would want to have some conversations around. If the exchanges provided more flexibility, to your point, mm -hmm. about where in our employees are at in their lifestyle, and you gave them money to fund that, that would give them the opportunity to real time, you know, this is best for me and the organization is helping to support me, but you know, I don't foresee in the near future a time where people are getting out and making sure that there's health care for their employee population. I would agree. Um, and we have had some of our small, small clients think, well, we're just going to move our employees to the exchange then. But it is not the same competitive benefit level that is required to compete in a market where you are seeing shortages in qualified workers and retention is so imperative and employees are really in a position where they they want to work somewhere that's great and that includes yeah. that total compensation package. So. But over time it may get there. I mean, you see it in the retiree yeah. space, right? So right. Um, those have it evolved may. over time and so I think some of it is watching mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. seeing who participates and how that space evolves. So uh, sort of on a peripheral level, are there are there like any particular um, employment law issues that um, uh, that um, companies have on their uh, their radar or should maybe should have on their radar um, uh, coming up? Um, uh, Kevin, I know uh, you had told me that employment law is one of your um, mm -hmm. areas that you yep. uh, talk about often with your clients. Or well, as as. As much as I hate to say this, <clears throat> uh, harassment is still very alive. Yeah. Uh, you would think after, what, 30-some years, 40-some years about this, that things have changed, and, and it really hasn't. Uh, so I'm still doing sexual harassment training, which has been going on for 30 years for me. But what's changing, though, I think, that's on the horizon, and, you know, Iowa's always a little bit behind, but we're, we're catching up. Um, clearly is the whole issues of religion and other cultures impacting the workplace <clears throat> and how people make adjustments to that at the, in, in the workplace. So some of my business not only just happens here in the greater Des Moines area but also in smaller communities and you're seeing it there. So if anyone thinks that Iowa, you know, if I live in a certain town in Iowa, I'm somehow you know, void of all this that's happening, they're, they're, you're misleading yourself. Right. It's, it's happening. Um, and so that's where you see some of the conflict that's happening in the workplace where it's like, uh, so what's this person's religion again? I never heard of it. And assumptions are being made, other cultural habits. Um, and, and it just uh, it creates, it creates fiction, or friction in the workplace. People act out on it. Uh, it can also happen from an employer standpoint where they choose not to hire someone and so on. So I've been addressing those kinds of issues. It's tough. The issue of sexual orientation is not going away um, as to acceptance of it, um, because it is, for some people, it's linked to religion. And religious issues are, you know, they're right now they're playing, they're really playing a key part in the whole political election. And so this whole issue of freedom of, you know, freedom of religious beliefs and so on, how does that play out in the workplace? Tough issues. Um, so I think those are things that you know employers still need to give attention to, be on the radar for. Um, to me, it's all about issues of respect. How is it that I can? I don't have to agree with you, Christy. I don't have to agree with you, religious or, or whatever, that you're gay or lesbian or whatever. But I can accept you for who you are as a person that I'm working with here for this organization to accomplish the purpose of why we're here. This to serve our clients, serve our customers, or whatever, and that's that's the focus. And people can get that in in focus. I think that that helps a lot to 
kind of temper some well, of those. Let me throw out a, a quick hypothetical and see if, if it's <coughs> either an issue that you guys might have run into or how you might handle it. So um, let's say somebody is uh, being asked to work on something and uh, it might have to do, uh, let's just say they're, they're working on a, an event and it's you know, specifically a uh, gay and lesbian uh, event of some sort. Or maybe it's a product or a, a project or something of some sort. But they they don't uh, their religious beliefs, and they come to you and say, "I don't want to work on this project because of my religious religious beliefs." As a company, you what what options do you have in that scenario? And I'm sure there's legal issues there too. I I, think, I, I imagine that being a messy situation, possibly. We we have an actual policy in place that allows an employee, if, if because of a religious belief. Mm -hmm. um, they can step out of a given situation um, and we'll reassign somebody else to that mm -hmm. to that project or to whatever that is that the mm -hmm. employee is working on. How long do you have that policy? Oh, almost forever. Yeah. Um, <laughs> only because when you're in healthcare, mm -hmm. you have a lot of people who who may have um, a religious belief um, being some kind of procedure um, or or regardless of what it is. But it, it, we've had that policy in place for quite a long period of time. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that new Amber Crombie case that just came yeah. down from the yeah. Supreme Court yesterday is yeah. really shedding some light on this for us. Amber Crombie? Mm -hmm. I should know. Yeah. 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 But um, so what happened in that case? Just as, so in yeah. that case, they had a young woman who applied for a position, and she wore the uh, wears the um, Muslim head mm -hmm. headdress and the head, head, head piece. Headpiece, and um, at any rate, they um, deemed her as qualified for the position, but determined that they couldn't hire her if she had to wear that to work. And um, but she never told them that she wore it as a part of her religion. Mm -hmm. So they said, "Well, we didn't know that she was needing a religious accommodation." Which, in most of the worlds of disability discrimination, mm -hmm. looking at accommodations, right. you yeah. have to be aware that there is a need for an accommodation. Yeah. And what the Supreme Court essentially said is. In religious discrimination, they do not have to tell you that it's based on a religious right. belief. Yeah. That you um, you still have you cannot make employment related decisions based on um, something that essentially could be right. So so they had to hire her. Yeah. So they had to hire her. And I right. think it was yeah. in that case it was quite apparent that the reason she was wearing that would had to do with you know religious beliefs. So. Uh, by the way, my daughter used to work there, oh. and so one of the issues that came up in that case had to do with, um, because they're in fashion, mm -hmm. and, right. and, and so on, is we want all our employees to dress a certain way that represents our product. Thank you, I missed that part. Yeah, no, <laughs> you know, and, and that's okay, there's nothing wrong, but mm -hmm. that's, mm -hmm. that was part of the, the issue that, that conflicted with the law, and by the way, I was a I mean that was an eight to one decision, so that's a that's a no brainer. Mm -hmm. The Supreme Court, and I wasn't surprised at right, that, right. that that should have been done. Uh, but those issues are going to come up. The issues of language are coming up more and more. Um, I still get questions about. So if some, my coworkers speak Spanish or or whatever, you know, I think I think he or she is talking about me. You know, can I tell them to stop? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, just all those kinds of issues. A lot of it has to, to do with because people are uncomfortable. This is new territory. Right. And so as human beings, we, we react. And, and, and so it's a matter of becoming comfortable in that situation. And multi-languages, multi-religions, mm -hmm. everything for prayer at work, because my religion says that's important to me. Yeah. I'm part of that. So all those things come into play. So Mercy, Mercy has the policy. I'm curious how principal might handle this. We, we do not have a policy like that. I mean, I think the, the first part is you're going to have a conversation with them, right, to understand, and mm -hmm. then you're also going to have a conversation with the leader to see is, is there someone else that the work can be assigned to. At the end of the day, if you believe as an organization that this is the right product, the right strategy, mm -hmm. Um, then we need the team to be able to move it forward. Yep. And then it may be a conversation with the person around, yep. is this the right role for you? Do we, you know, we have mm -hmm. another opportunity? But I, it's, I would not say it's a black and white, you mm -hmm. know, I decision. I think you agree. have, for us, we'd have to ask a lot more questions to really understand the what, specific situation. What is the ability to accommodate, yep. I think, is what it really boils right. down to. Right. Uh, imagine company size might have an influence on that, too. I mean, your three-person business versus a principal, mm -hmm. that could create a, another yeah. 
You know, it's it's so interesting in that front. The answer to that is yes, yeah. right? Partic particularly from an outside entity, whether it's the EEOC or DOS, somebody's going to come in and look at you largely. But you know, principals also made up of a lot of small teams. Mm -hmm. you, sure. you know, and yeah. so you know, yeah. so it it, it yeah. isn't as easy as saying you know you have ten thousand employees here in Des Moines, and so you're just going to move people because needs are different, skill sets are different, knowledge bases are different, mm -hmm. but the end of the day your point's well taken and that you still have a very large base of employees yeah. mm -hmm. to navigate that with. Yeah. But those are conversations you have to have with the leader, right, who's trying to solve their immediate issue. Mm -hmm. are, are the three of you seeing changes in the, in, in, in the, in the, in the, uh, the makeup of, of workforces? For example, for your clients, Christy as well as Principal and Mercy, whether it's cultural differences, racial differences, and so on. I mean, are we, you know, Iowa is just a little bit of, of the big world, but for example, if you go to Roosevelt High School, which my niece graduated from, clearly less than 50% of the senior class is white. Right. All right. I mean, the change is happening mm -hmm. so fast. Are you seeing that kind of reflected? In it's your not, workforce, or I, I would say it's not yet. In the, yeah, in? I was going to say. I yeah. think that over time you're going to see it reflected. I think you're you're still seeing it in the elementary, junior high, high school okay. that haven't yet completely hit the workforce yeah. yet. Okay. So I think we're going to see that trend, you know, the next five, seven years. Okay. But we we have not, as you you look at availability, yeah. um, we have not seen availability numbers change. Yeah, and if you look at our population compared to what it was. Even 10 years ago, yes, it has changed dramatically. Yep. You know, far more diverse. Um, you know, we try we try to do um, training with our nurses, um, so they know in terms of the populations that mm -hmm. they're serving. Yeah. You know, yeah. yes. um, yep. there we go. Be it Asian or be it um, Hispanic or whatever, these are some of the cultural beliefs, those yep. types of things that they need to be aware of when they're caring for those patients. But all, and also doing some culture um, sensitivity training um, yep. with our employees, yep. be, just because. You know, we saw a large influx of the Bosnian population yeah. a number of years ago. Yeah. Um, that's evident within our organization. And as there's there's um, pockets of um, individuals coming into the Des Moines community, it does reflect within your organization yeah. as they as they yeah. arrive. Yeah. Yeah. We have definitely seen the impact, um, and really, um, it's somewhat by industry for the companies that mm -hmm. we serve. Mm -hmm. But more now than ever, we are being called upon to provide our materials in multi-languages yeah, sure. and yeah. have people available for translation services or yeah, services. And um, we really embrace that. I mean, we mm -hmm. think that's important to be a mm -hmm. good employer. You yep. need to ensure that your employees really understand what's required of them at work, what our policies are, what the benefits are that they're entitled to. Sure. So I think it's wow. a really good opportunity for us. Just anecdotally, too, I would tell you I have an 11-year-old son, and one of the things that I love most about him is that he cares if people are nice or not nice. Yeah. And I think that <laughs> I go. think that gets to your point, Kevin, that you were making earlier, is that that is yeah. just really where we need to be evolving as businesses and yeah. as leaders in businesses. It's just um, nice, not nice. Can you do the job? Can you not do the yeah. job? If you can't do the job right now, is there something we could do that could help you? Because really yeah. our job, and really in HR, our job is to ensure people have the tools and resources yeah. mm -hmm. to be successful yeah. and to help the company perform well. So, kind of started touching on you know, your, 11, your 11 year old. And I'm curious as we, we've spent a lot of time talking about millennial and that generation. Mm -hmm. And then I'm curious about a little bit if workforces, if HR is getting ready at all for whatever the next <laughs> wave would be, and if there's any things maybe popping up. Like generation 2020. <laughs> <laughs> really, really. Yeah. I think, I, think yeah. I just read something yeah. around that. Yeah, but I, yeah. you know, I don't know. But sure. <laughs> I'm just curious if you guys have started to prepare at all for, or maybe read anything about what maybe the. You know, the millennial, at some point, millennials aren't that age group that you talk about. Yeah. Some of, I think they, I read recently that average age group is like 30, which, yeah. which, which again, you know, you think about yeah. that millennial generation yeah. as the teens and 20s, right. and you know, they, they are aging mm -hmm. as well. You know, I, I would say we're just starting to have conversations around that next generation. Like I said, I just recently picked up a book, and they actually were starting to, to map out, like there's 47 million people in that mm -hmm. generation 2020, and they were starting to pull some characteristics out on that. But I, from my perspective, I think it's a little too soon to tell the implications in the business world mm -hmm. right around that. Other than you know, you're going to take whatever you know about the millennials and how they like technology and how they like collaboration and how they like, and some of that's going to probably speed up with that next group, right? Because that's all they've known. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Multi-generational 
workforce. You know, when you, when you have all these generations working within a given department, um, there tends to be tension every now and then because um, my generation, um, those younger kids don't work as hard as I do. They don't have, you know, it's that, that's, that's the mentality. So you have to make sure that you are able to balance that and as a manager of a, yeah. of a unit, it makes it very challenging for you. I also think in terms of these generations, um, you know, I, I think in terms of um, the baby boomers, that was a long generation. But as time is passing by, it seems like these generations are becoming more and more and more frequent because they change so frequently. Oh, right. Um, so, 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 you know, we had Generation X, we had Generation Y, we have Millennials, we have, you know, we didn't have all of those before. And I think technology has a lot to do mm -hmm. with it. Um, but I think it's just something that we're going to have to be continually looking at in the future in terms of what are the needs of these generations and how do we attract them to our organizations and how do we keep them in our organizations and happy. Okay. I would guess within, yeah, with, even within those set, you know, take baby boomers or millennials, there's world events and things that are happening yeah. too that are going to influence a very a smaller subset within millennials. Yeah. I, I graduated in 2009, right as the recession was happening, yes. right as the stock market was going down, and that is going to have an impact Absolutely. on how I view jobs. Right. I saw what happened to people yeah. where there's uh, people that uh, weren't quite yet ready to mm -hmm. be graduating, maybe didn't quite see the same mm -hmm. impact the same way that I might have seen it, that's that are now considered millennials. So yeah. That's interesting that you say that, though. I did recently read an article that for the first time in like 20 or 30 years, when they surveyed recent grads, what they said was most important to them is job stability, not perks, not crazy perks. <laughs> so that, I think, is indicative of the impact even seeing your parents go through the recession and seeing well, that's all well and good, but I want to know that I'm going to have a job and I'm not going to have to go through a time period where I'm on unemployment. Or looking and I've heard that from a number of my friends that have said things, and not just not just my age. I've heard from others that have said, "I want, I need to keep adding skills, and need, mm -hmm. I need to keep making sure that if the next thing happens, I can mm -hmm. still go market myself mm -hmm. to find a job and be work, as opposed to staying in the same job for the next 20 years." Mm -hmm. and I, I think yeah. that's got to be a direct reflection of what we, what we saw with that. So. I think some of it is, but I also think some of it is the generation itself, right? There is this natural tendency around development, right? Not to say that all generations don't want to develop, but the speed of development, I think, is different in this generation, and how, how they want to develop is different, right? Some of it's personal, but a lot of it is this team development, team influencing, mm -hmm. team and um, that I think is different from other generations and how they view development. So where, uh, where, where are some of the biggest skills gaps then, uh, I mean, uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, in the organizations? Uh, you know, where, where are the real needs um, where people are, are lacking? Where they, uh, we, we talked about team development mm -hmm. as, a, as a need, but are there, are there other areas that, um, that are really uh, perhaps a, Need to be addressed, or uh, or that are keeping people from filling, you know, positions that are open, perhaps. Yeah, I think for for us, and this is an, an individual from an individual perspective, but you know, you're you're reading now and seeing just a lot more around leadership, right? What does leadership look like? How do you define leadership? Um, and that gets to some of your yeah. comments around yeah. the, the coaching piece versus the leading piece, and how do you assess leaders? I think. For many of us growing up in organizations, there, I, I think many corporations have viewed because you were technically really good at the role, you're now ready to move into a leadership role. And I think we're many of us are taking a step back now to say, um, we, we there may be a lot of people in leadership roles that don't have these the leadership competencies. They might be great people. They might have very strong skills around the job piece of it, but how do you lead, how do you inspire people, how do you develop people is not an area that everybody in a leadership role has. And that's going to gain, I think, a lot more focus, even than we're seeing today. A lot of people are putting time and effort into assessing that so they get the right leaders going forward. Yeah. Being more purposeful mm -hmm. and, and truly taking a step back, because as you indicated, we're going to have to have phenomenal leaders in the future because there's a lot of things they're going to have to be able to address and and again building a team all of those things are part of it and they could like you said have very good technical skills but they may not be the person to be in a leadership role we're seeing that same 
um, gap, if you will. And, and I think, too, a part of it for us is when um, you have small to mid-sized businesses that go through a recession, a lot of times the first thing that is cut is talent yeah. development. Yeah. What I'm really encouraged by, though, is we are seeing um, more of an emphasis from our business owners and CEOs on HR as truly that strategic partner that I mentioned before and the recognition that training and talent development is not optional. We have to equip our managers to be able to be great leaders. Mm -hmm. And because if they aren't, it really, really adversely impacts the ability to be highly productive and maximize on you know, profits, <coughs> profitability. So. The, the issue about, about leadership, <clears throat> if you remember last year, Time Magazine, I think one of their covers was about mindfulness. Um, and that's one thing I've been really working mm -hmm. in the last several years. I attended a mindful leadership summit in D.C. last mm -hmm. November, 600 people. And these are CEOs of organizations and consultants who have been working for years in bringing mindfulness to their organizations and to, and to leaders. So it's more than just the skills mm -hmm. of a leader. Mm -hmm. It's also the self-awareness um, and the being part of a leader. So like, for example, the issues about emotional intelligence. Yes. Where does that all fit in? Uh, the one's ability to deal with a lot of uncertainty because order things are not crystal clear anymore. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of ambiguity. And how is that that I'm a leader can somehow lead in the midst of that, not knowing where we're really going sometimes. And so it's dealing with a lot of discomfort for people by virtue of that. How do I personally deal with change? All those kinds of things. And, and they're seeing great value in what that's bringing to organizations mm -hmm. as a way uh, of leading and creating an environment that still foster, maybe in the midst of, of adversity or uncertainty. I think it's just going to be absolutely, absolutely critical uh, that that keeps developing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and yeah. providing Great providing the um, providing change leadership training for, yeah. for your for your management team as well as employees because we, at least in healthcare, and I'm sure it's this way in a lot of the industries, we're in constant change. Yeah, you know, to be able to sit back and say, okay, let's just take a break. It's never going to happen again. It, you're you're going to be constantly in change, and it's going. It's going to impact the employees. It's going to impact your organization. So you got to be able to have those change leaders that can help lead that change yeah. and help keep it to as minimal of a of a uh, impact to the organization as possible. Yeah. Well, we have about uh, just just over five minutes or so left for time. And what I thought would be a good way for us to kind of wrap up is uh, there are probably about. I bet if Joe looked down at his list, about 15 topics, he probably couldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I know I have a million topics. We could go on forever, we could go on forever which, is, which is great. There's so many issues around, around this topic. We've got a power breakfast coming up this, uh, well, when this runs anyways. We'll, we've already happened on mental health. Um, that's a, a whole issue you know, for, yes. for workplaces. So we're going to break that out. But I thought it would be good for us to wrap up is to, if everybody could identify maybe something that we haven't touched on today. Uh, that uh, you might be able to say is an issue or something that we should be should have talked about and maybe a little bit of background on that. Uh, your last question, <laughs> Joe, what's the skill gap and so on? It's it's, it shouldn't be surprising, but it seems to me that when I'm working with clients, the number one issue that always comes to the forefront is people's inability to communicate and to relate um, it's just like this is not rocket science and, and it all gets down to human behavior it gets down to how is it that I can effectively relate in the context of a working relationship um, and, and, that, and then of course that that flows out to issues of teams projects everything else but those are the basic things and be able to communicate written as well as verbally um, and, and to not place judgment on other people to listen very attentively, take that in. Critical skills, they are still lacking. Um, and technology isn't helping us to do that, all right? Nor is it distracting. It's just, it's just a human issue that seems to surface every time. I would like so, to piggyback Christine. on that and really take it also to the corporate level of communication. Yeah. Um, just really um, recognizing the impact that an effective and planful communication, internal communication yeah. strategy has on recruiting and retaining top talent, building trust in organizations, trust in management, um, and creating environments where people can be their best and do their best. Yeah. And I think sometimes we think of that as, oh yeah, what's the communication plan? And it's a little bit of an aside. 
And what we're finding is most effective is when you really think about communication as part of the one, two, three of any objective that you're yeah. rolling out. That's good. I guess I would say along with effective communication, one thing that I feel um, is lacking in a lot of organizations and something that I think a lot of coming to the forefront for organization is customer service. Mm -hmm. um, it is not where it used to be years ago. Um, I think it's something that needs to be more focused. It needs to be more, um, there needs more, more training about it. Um, it's not only the external customer, but it's also the internal customer, how you treat each other. Um, but truly getting down, and it's, again, it's down to the basics, but unfortunately our society has forgotten about the ba yeah. basics yeah. is what it's come down to. Where do you, you think that comes from? The, the over time that that's happened so far. Now there seems to be that shift back to mm -hmm. it. And it's so refreshing when you, when you do, <laughs> I you do come across your customers. I always blame the millennials. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's a good way. I can't wait for that next year. <laughs> so I can play the 2020. Yeah, yeah right. It is definitely a skill gap. Yeah, it is it's a skill like gap. It's like anything else. We have to pay attention. We have to devote resources. It's about training. And you hate to say that you have to teach people how to be nice, but that's what it comes down to. You've got to teach how to, how to be nice, respectful, um, and truly try to meet the needs of the customer. Um, you just don't see that today yeah. as you did in the past. Yeah. Hold people accountable too. Yeah. I mean, Absolutely. there was a long era when we we're really tight on qualified candidates where, you know, we've all been there. Well, and I used to work in healthcare, so she's a really great nurse. Nobody likes her, but she's a really great <laughs> nurse. You know, and now we're getting to the point where we're realizing that's not a really great nurse, yeah. right? Yeah. Those are not two different things. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. It's that whole issue of hospitality. Yeah. No matter, even if you're not quite in the hospitality industry, it's still hospitality. So how is it that I can be attentive and present to people that I work with as well as who I serve? Yeah. Listening and being present with them. That, it's, a, it's, a, it's a skill, and, and, and but we, we all feel it when we're the consumer. Yes. <laughs> we know what that feels like, and it yeah. does make a difference. And it's a great one. Yeah. Yeah. My last piece, we spent quite a bit of time talking about healthcare, but I think I'd be remiss if I also didn't make the point around you know retirement readiness. That's yeah. something yes. that clearly yes. employers mm -hmm. are, are wanting to make sure their employees are ready for retirement, but also understanding that employers are not going to take that on themselves to make sure that readiness is there. And so, you know, we, we clearly being in the business, we talk about this a lot, but there, there are definitely things that small business owners, medium business owners, large business owners can do to make sure that their employees are personally invested in that and getting ready. And, you know, we talk a lot about the auto enrollment piece, right? The mm -hmm. fact that yeah. when having people make a decision to not participate, Correct. you have inertia right, with you right. to have people move forward. And so if they're not making a decision, I'm going to get into this plan, but they have to literally take action to get out. Yeah. Yeah. That helps you even get into the plan to begin with. Yeah. And then um, we talk about auto escalate, which is, you know, every year you go up automatically, 1%. you know, to get to, right, 1% mm -hmm. a year. Um, we say people should be saving at least 10% of their income. We understand particularly, we spend a lot of time talking about millennials, but you know, you're coming out of school, you have the burden of a lot of debt, you're trying to get yourself set up. When people talk to you about a 10%, that seems very large yeah. part, right? So if you need to start smaller, but that, but once a year, you typically get a merit increase. So that's the time in which maybe part of your merits coming to you personally, and part of it's automatically 1% increasing yes. over time to get you up to that 10%. Mm -hmm. And then the third piece that businesses can do, and you know, and you know, and this is that you know, if they're doing a match, stretch the match, mm -hmm. right? So instead of doing 100% at six, you do 75% at eight. It encourages the employee to save more themselves, and it's not an additional cost to the organization. So there are ways, you know, to kind of help share that part. And I think the more around design that we help support that, the more people will take accountability. Are, are you seeing the? Keep using the millennials generation. Are you seeing them signing up for the? Uh, I would assume within principle with those, yep. those plans that's really helpful. Are you seeing that as something within the? Uh, uh, this, is, this is live studio. <laughs> <laughs> um, are you seeing that within some of the clients you're working with too? That you're seeing a lot of people signing up for the retirement accounts. Actually, um, what we find more is we're deploying a lot of strategies mm -hmm. and making those same recommendations with our clients because that is one of the number one questions that I get asked right now is how do we um, encourage employees to participate mm -hmm. in the 401k mm -hmm. plan yeah. Yeah. or in their deferred compensation plans because it is such an important element, but there is a miss there, mm -hmm. uh, lost with instant gratification, mm -hmm. needing, feeling like you need the cash right. maybe. Right. 
Um, and so we have been deploying all of the same strategies that Beth has been talking about or sharing those with our clients. We've had great success with that. Um, I do think it is, it's very important to move to, it's, you have to take yourself out right. as opposed to waiting around. I mean, we have employees that will watch and we're thinking, this is free money. Right. I mean, like even a little bit of it is free money. Why are you not putting your, you know, getting your free money? And, um, but I do honestly think people get so busy that there is a complacency that surrounds it. Right. Education is not enough alone, right? We know that in everything, whether it's healthcare, whether it's retirement, everybody knows what they need to do. They're not taking action to move it forward. And that's why if you automatically put in place things that move them, Right. then they have to take decisions to stop it, right? Mm -hmm. That's the alternative of it's mm -hmm. all open, you just go ahead and decide. That inertia doesn't happen on its own. Mike Helick with, uh, Mike Helick with US Bank, uh, regional president here, he was talking about financial literacy being that next big yes. buzzword that you're gonna see within the schools trying to help educate mm -hmm. students. Yep. So it's amazing how many people start their job and don't have any idea how to make a budget that's or right. do all those type of things. Yes. And right. Um, I think that's, I thought he was, it was a really yep. good point that he made that I think will ultimately help when yep. he starts talking about retirement. And care, that's so. transitioning to what in the business world we're calling financial wellness, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. people get into your corporation and yeah. they still don't know how mm -hmm. to set up budgets or they have, you know, credit card debt mm -hmm. or they got student loans. And so how do you help them with the, the beginning pieces of that? But then financial wellness is really taking a look at not just your retirement, mm -hmm. but your healthcare piece, right? Yeah. So you're looking at everything in totality to get yourself mm -hmm. ready mm -hmm. for the future, but right. you're taking the steps to get there. Well, guys, I really appreciate you guys all spending the time to come in and talk with us. Like I said, we might, we might turn the camera off and keep you in here for a little bit longer. <laughs> uh, but, and, and thank you again to our audience that uh, uh, watched along as well. Uh, Joe's going to be putting together a story, so that'll be online. Uh, my contact information will be popping up on the screen as will Joe's. Uh, feel free to reach out to us with any uh, story ideas, any possible trends or issues or reaction to what you saw here today. Um, we really appreciate your time and uh, look forward to seeing you guys all again. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much.